from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. I've got Kate here who has an exciting way to start us off. Oh. Hey, I, I had to show this to Dan because it does not fail. Every single episode, Dan plugs environmental conscious, conscientiousness. So yes. here it is. North water. Replacing all plastic water bottles, reusable, 100% recyclable, even the lid, even the tab, everything. And it's locally sourced from Alberta and BC. We are doing our part, Dan. How do you like that? I love it. I love it. Boom. There you go. I knew if anybody would appreciate this company and this product, it'd be you. Yeah, it's like the preemptive, uh, the preemptive strike. So I, I, yeah. I give the crown, I give the crown to Kate and uh, Adam. Your turn. You got to raise the bar next time for a little bit more epicness, and you have to think of something environmental. So um, okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. So that's geez, Adam's going to start the next one. <laughs> Amazing. See, just, my work here is done. I don't have to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> the environmental plug was bound to happen. We just might as well start with it. Yeah, and yeah. it's coming from Albertans. That's just so, you know, if Albertans can do it, then maybe Texas too, you know? <laughs> there you go. And I'm born and raised Albertan. So Same here. Same here. Yeah. So Caitlin, you are go. you from Alberta, born and raised? Uh, I'm told I'm from Ontario, but I used oh, to pronounce yeah. it Ontario. I don't know. I just got told I was pronouncing it wrong out here in Alberta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm known as the Alberta is known as the Prairie Ferry. So, uh, oh, a Prairie Ferry, right? This is the thing. And I go, yeah, I'm a, I'm a full blown uh, tree hugger. So this is, this is, you know, just embrace it, right? And you look at the person, you know, fuming and getting upset about that, and go, what? Why? <laughs> like, is that is that why Alberta kicked you out? <laughs> no, um, although we could put that into the biography, that would be a really interesting one, right? Like, I, let's say, like a biography by proxy or by vote. It's like, well, how should his life turned out? Have turned out, right? Like, <laughs> wouldn't it have been more dramatic if we had done this? Oh yeah, shit, that's what fiction's for. Okay, that's why we're here today. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, we've been having some fun with this. Uh, our our contribution to the, to the to this book is slowly accelerating. We're on an exponential curve here, Dan. So. You know, this is this is the flow state that you want to be in, and and it is it is oddly enough, um, it is it is production orientated because you you know you, if you if you grab that idea and you're like shit, I'm just pumping out a thousand words, and I'm I, you know I just I can't write it fast enough. It's like. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that happens and other times it's blocked, but I'm glad to see that it's opening up for you guys. Wow. And and unblocking the flow has been, I think, part and parcel to working with you, Dan, like getting us to just think outside of the box, right? A little bit challenging us, you know, letting us permission to fail in the first draft, I think is key too, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm building on this, you know, this uh, permission to fail. Um, there's some wisdom in that, but it's like the the idea is is that no masterpiece or even just a, a generally well written book, you know, doesn't typically come out in the first draft, right? It's you know, you don't want to lose the uh, you know the power of the ideas, right? The thing that kind of orientated you to writing a book in the first place. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's why I re I really try and um, you know focus on 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 the meta of the book, like the thirty thousand you know foot view of the book, and and keep trying to move it forward. And I mean, shit, a good editor eventually, a good editor can you know come down and correct uh, everything from grammar to uh, like misuse of of um, 
perspective and first person, third person, you know, all these kinds of things, and then actually make some improvements. But at, at that point, you have the theme of the book and you know what's going. And then it, it, it becomes more of a calculated decision to say, you know, what, what kind will this, you know, add to the book or what does it take away from the book? Yeah. Right? And we want to get to that point. So exciting. It's very exciting. We introduced some new characters. I'm very excited about these ones, actually. That was a cool idea. All yeah. right, Adam, why don't you tell us uh, about uh, uh, some of these characters? Let's uh, delve right into it. Well, it was Caitlin's brainchild. Um, basically, you know, the, the whole idea of our, our character being sent in a, in a pod to a you know, corrective facility and then somebody steals it. And because of all the security and blockchain and all this kind of stuff, you need some serious hacking power to do that. So we've got these two hacker characters that are uh, kind of lively and uh, curmudgeon -y And I also found very interesting. I think we might find ways to bring at least one of them back into the story way later. Uh, but I think that's the cool thing about the process. It's kind of like bubbled up and evolved and like, hey, there's a spot for like a cool character here. Let's roll with it. So uh, kudos to Keelan for, for this brainchild. Any any comedic aspects to the to this duo? Yeah. Well, kind of like a little quirky, like edgy. So um, it, the two characters, I've named them so far, uh, Sheik and Cash. Okay. And uh, Sheik is like a little just kind of has like a little like sarcasm to her you know and so uh i think she might be able to bring some comedic relief but kind of like in a dry sarcastic tone <laughs> well i almost cool. see this character when i was listening to you read it yesterday kayla i almost pictured it like the directness and the abruptness and the rough around the edges kind of like you know crook essentially or smuggler or kind of the hand solo ish yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah. Right. But I thought that would be such a neat contrast to the world in which our character is living, which is which is not that. It's you know, scheming and indirectness. And um so I thought this would be like a really cool um pairing at some point. That's kind of what I envisioned. It's gonna be really neat. I and I'm super excited about how Sheik gets reintroduced back in. So we talked about a little bit about that, and we have like a possible replug-in entry point for Sheik and maybe actually becoming one of the main characters. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Well, I want to give you a heuristic to think about when it comes to um, when it comes to comedy, right? We've already talked about the overcoming and the and the, and the, you know the pivot points for uh, the tragedy or our hero. Mm -hmm. um and so if if you if you use the idea of, of 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 comedy in here then don't think of it's like uh i i've got to write jokes yeah. um the foundation of a comedy is to poke fun, fun at authority right and so this is a really interesting way to look at this abstractly ah, yeah oh i why. like it yeah. so in a in a in a in judaic sense um uh, you know, the chosen people of God, this is what the, um, the Jews are self-proclaimed as. Um, a lot of their literature in the Old Testament, at least from a, a comedy standpoint, you can look at something like the Book of Esther. And it's kind of poking fun uh, at uh, the generations, right? You, you know, you, you have a Jewish people that are under the rule of thumb of a, of a, of a kind of like a ridiculous... Uh, uh, I guess like an, a ridiculous authority, right? And this is the role that comedy has has really played: is that it, it pokes fun at authority. But it's it, it's like, how are you framing authority? And so the Jewish tradition takes it about as wide as we can, uh, generally, um, generationally, right? So it, it it takes it and it's basically, well, you know, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass, kind of thing, right? And kind of poking fun along the way. Um, the the faster turnaround on authority has to do with this mis mistaken identities like a threes company or like two twins identical twins show up and the wife doesn't know like this is the goofy kind of stuff right mm -hmm. um and but, 
<laughs> yeah, but there's there's a lot of that that actually shows up in in, in Greek tra- tragedy. So you can or um, comedy. So it's what you want to poke fun at, and sometimes it's just like the silliness of the society. I think yours requires a little bit more gravity to it, but you can still poke fun at it. And yeah. the poking fun that you think is like, um, where do you want to prod? Right. Like, um, well, I, I like I, the authority thing, like poking yeah. fun at the authority. is mm-hmm. really good. I think that resonates really well because our character Quinn's going to come back in to disrupt like the way businesses are run. Right. And, uh, and I think, having this sort of this sort of like edgy sarcastic partner along for the ride who can help him you know get plugged back in and to change the world and like really kind of push the boundaries and doesn't follow the the programmed like subscription that all the other businesses follow is like a really cool way to sort of like bust through that authority right hmm but what if you had the um like the bringing together of the two that there's sarcasm is so wonderful right because it's so disarming uh, and you know so so is comedy but what if the um the way that these two characters came together is that um the sarcasm is about the, the character development and you know adding a certain kind of feel and flavor to the to the novel but <clears throat> where they come together is the you know, uh, some sort of an emergence from the character comes from some of this poking fun. That, that might be an interesting way to, to bridge oh, yeah. the two of them. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'll be fun to explore. It, um, it's actually been kind of an interesting experience because I, I started writing it really at the beginning. And Caitlin started writing in the middle. That's what does. Her ideas and her ideas are like, ooh, that actually, I should put a little plug in that here that'll be cool to bring up later so it's like influencing kind of as we go as the story evolves in two different places really um so i don't know it's kind of cool i kind of enjoyed that um i don't know maybe that kind of like (laughs) that creativity or that random influence maybe that's not for everybody but uh, it works for us (laughs) So. I, 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 you know, there, I mean, there's, there's basically two kind of divisions of uh, accepted writers in terms of, um, I, I guess, how, how the process goes. There's the, the idea of the pantsers and then the idea of the structuralists. And, um, you know, invariably, like any human activity, there's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a combination of a few of them, right? But I think, um, you know, I gel a lot with you guys because I, I I do structure a lot of my creativity, right? I, as Isaac Newton did, he he had a notebook and he had all these headings that he eventually came back to and filled in. Now, some of them, well, I shouldn't say that that he came back to, and some of the headings he never filled in. And um, you know, this is you know this is the kind of thing that it's like you know the idea starts with almost. Um, uh, a, a cohesive sentence or thought and realizing where and how you're going to plug it in, it may never make the cut. Um, but uh, at least for me to have this overarching uh, structure, similar to the way you guys put it on the um, idea board, mm-hmm. right, is really helpful. And, you know, in, in a certain extent, there's no way of escaping, um, you know, the engineering uh mentality that has actually got you guys you know, where, where you guys are right like it's like no but we, we have you that. i'm not gonna we've been, we've been a disappointment to our parents oh but yeah well who hasn't very right? that's the idea right? well, honestly, it like, this is this is why this is our, our differentiator call it right yes we're engineers so of course we plan the 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 idea or the story arc out in terms of like themes or scenes or characters or whatever but not to the you know the, the minutia where there, there was no room it was kind of like here's a box and then the next there's going to be another box that's going to be something like this and then it was like go play in it right so it's uh you know structured for sure but also with deliberately creating freedom to just have fun and create um and that's you know that, that has really worked well for us i think so far yeah no i mean i mean let's let's just fast forward to the you know to the launch of the of, of well the we can fast and... forward 
Yeah, we can do that. We can imagine <laughs> the future. It's just this, <laughs> this uniquely human thing we can do. So we can pretend. We can pretend, oh. you know, very much like, you know, the religious folks do. Um, that reality is oddly different from the way we actually see it. So if we had this idea, if we had this idea, we imagine like the critics ripping apart the book later on. Right. And they say, yeah, these couple of engineers, they, uh, you know, no wonder it's so disjointed and it doesn't follow. I mean, sure it follows a legit, but it doesn't, you know, the, the imageries don't, you know, connect. Right. So this is something to put on the radar to understand that, as you're writing this, you, you know, to make this, um, and, and it may feel like an enormous amount of pressure, but, um, for someone that loves writing, um, I think that that pressure is what is, 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 is what can make something great. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's more than a report guys, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it is, but the thing is, is that on something that you create, uh, a, a book of literature uh, has a has an ability to tap into something uniquely human, and it has the potential to attain everlasting life. Now it sounds a little tropey and cliche, but long after we're gone, someone or many people might be reading your book, and that that's kind of cool. I think. Well, you if know. we put it into time capsule, maybe it travels to the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, who as I see like so Orwell writes his book, you know, 1984, and it's an easy one to remember, the year 1948. So it, you know, I mean, we're still reading it. Why? Why are we still reading it? You know, what is it about that particular book that, you know, of, of, of totalitarian warning and you know, that he was able to capture and 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 uh I, I would urge you guys to, um, yeah, pick up 1984 again and just listen to how amazing he is from the beginning of it. Get the audio book and just listen to the first hour of that book. And you're like, wow. Right. Like still to this day, it, it's like it's so amazingly well written. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a definite style. And you could say, well, I, I can pick up that Orwellian style and your style will be a little different, right? But you, you just keep returning to like some amazing books and you'll be blown away as, as, as any connoisseur of good literature will, <laughs> this'll do that. That'll do this to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you guys drink alcohol? Oh, you're Albertan. Yes, of course. I never forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Am I right? Right. <laughs> yep. I yeah, drink alcohol. Right? Yeah, we do, yeah, we just that's the way it goes. Um, and so, if you if you guys approach this, um, you know, from a standpoint of, uh, what, you know, what's your, what's your liquor of choice? That's that would be the question. Like, is it, Caitlin, are you a beer gal, or are you into like whiskey, or what? What? what, gin. Are you, what are you, oh, gin. Okay. Wow. Gin. Okay, Adam, what are you Rum. into? Rum. Rum. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. The one. Uh, Okay, so when you guys first, you know, started becoming connoisseurs of liquor, um, you'd understand that there's probably a little bit of difference between, you know, different rums and, and 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 gin and you know various different things. So yeah, why don't you tell me about connoisseurship and the um, and and liquid lunches and all this kind of stuff? Uh, well, I mean. I hated gin up until two years ago. I thought it tasted like a bag of smashed assholes. Like it was the dirtiest thing out there. And uh, my friend, Carlin, and his wife, Elena, were over and we were having some drinks and he made himself a gin. And I said, oh, dirty. And he's like, have you tried it? And I'm like, yeah, it's disgusting. He's like, try this. And it was a gin and tonic, very simple. I took a sip and I was like, this is amazing. He's like, let me guess. You've been drinking beef feeder. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so he actually had a nice, decent bottle of like, it was a Bombay Sapphire. So like mid-range bottle of gin. And it was so delicious. And then there's a gin distillery down the road from me called Eau Claire, which if you have not tried the Eau Claire gin, and their, their whiskey's actually won a ton of awards as well. Amazing. And uh, 
I just became like, I really appreciated a nice gym after that. Yeah. So yeah. The only other thing that we could be years. doing is, is, you know, I think there's some advertising sort of things like you're, you know, back in the day, you, you, you couldn't record videos or, you know, movies while you're smoking and stuff. You know, we could just light it up and move the time period to sometime after four o'clock and uh, just completely, you know, show up with our 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 drug of choice and uh, just get inebriated and, and see how the ratings of that those shows go. Who knows? It might oh, be the next. I, uh... I feel like we should actually. <laughs> we should have a runaway podcast day. Yeah. That's oh, let's see. I'm in. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, tell us a rum uh, story. You got a rum story, Adam? Uh, yes and no. I'm, uh, so connoisseur is an interesting word because I have friends who claim to be, you know, liquor connoisseurs, whether it's whiskey or scotch or rum or tequila or whatever. Problem is, I don't like straight alcohol. I don't, it's too, like, makes me cringe so i always mix it with pepsi or coke or you know oh. some kind of mix but i do recognize the difference between a cheap bottle of rum and a good bottle of rum even if i'm mixing it so that makes some people crazy but uh you know i, I like it so you know what is your definition of connoisseur someone who you know is educated and truly understands like the different tastes and the that went into it or is it somebody that's tried a bunch of stuff and is just comfortable with picking this one um you know well come on i think adam rum. needs a little bit of help on the rum side i think so i'm a, I'm a i was a rum guy myself uh yeah. my wife and i went to uh to spain and that was at the, at the point where i said i i'm i'm, I'm you know kind of done with alcohol it's just it's so it, it feels like I, I dated a girl a long time ago we went uh before I was married and that helps to tell well, you guys that, before I was married right so yeah. anyways that's the like, best time to date is before you're married it's less complicated that way right <laughs> <laughs> you know like I tell you so anyways we were we, you know we ended up in Hawaii and and she's uh you know was a wonderful girl but just didn't work out with us and uh um but she was allergic to alcohol and 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 so I was like god come on you can have it you know, well, if at two drinks, I mean, I was literally having to carry her home, right? And it was, you know, we flew all the way to Hawaii and, you know, we're young and athletic and energetic. And so there's certain things you want to do, not just have a couple of drinks and then come back and pass out, right? So anyways, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> she literally could not have more than two drinks and she was completely like passed out, right? And so anyways, that that's that's not... You know, that that's a little bit of a disadvantage. But I remember learning business in Alberta. This is my territory, you guys. Learning business. Uh, now, if I point you guys into the direction of southwest Calgary, and I'm talking about Southland area, there's yeah. a road called Horton Road. Yeah, and I on Horton, Horton Road, on yeah, there. you did. Okay. Well, yeah. down the backside of Longhorns, which is now shut down, Yeah. Um, my old boss actually owned all that property. Okay. And he rented out semi-trailer vans, uh, containers, construction equipment, uh, and this type of thing. So that was where I got my business education because we we had these meetings at four o'clock and they're called safety meetings. And so, you know, the idea is like, you know, there's a bunch of guys in an ATCO trailer. Nobody moves. Nobody gets hurt as long as you got your rum and coke in your hand. See, I tie yeah. that back into the rum and coke. I was wondering where we were going. Where are we going with that, right? So, so the connoisseur is going to say, yes, I agree with you, Adam. There's a, there's a time and a place for, uh, you know, some sort of mix with this. And I, I mean, I knew because I was the gopher that had to go and get the liquor, right. For all yeah. of the, the guys, right. I was just the young university guy. So when I would take these back to the, the bottle depot, which there was handily in one right on Horton road, there is. um, there was this, uh, like, uh, uh, I guess it was like um, a mixture of like one two liter Diet Coke for every 950 milliliter <laughs> liquor, right? So this is this is pretty much like a one yeah a one to two ratio in terms of liquor and and, and <laughs> Diet yeah. Coke, right? So okay. yeah, you know this was this was you know we were up to nothing but trouble, 
and uh, and, uh, and 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 ensure it was fun. This was back in the day where you know you could tie a a, a drill to the bumper of a guy's car when he drove away half inebriated, right? Because I mean, you can't do this anymore, right? And it, it, it's not advocating for drunk driving, but it, man, <laughs> for the record, I think it was been illegal. For a long time, but even okay. at that time it was illegal. Even at that time it was illegal. <laughs> and all this kind of crap, right? And uh, but somehow uh, it's like he's, for, for the people watching, this is allegedly. Go on, Dan. Allegedly, yeah. That that was my name through all through university. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to invite allegedly? Who knows? You may show up. You may not. I don't know. But, you know. <laughs> What this makes me think of with your story, Dan, is you know when I'm when I'm thinking of a scene in a character, I'm like okay, I want my character to get out of bed, I want them to go here, I want them to start working, I want them to interact with people, and this is like roughly what I want to happen, right? And then I start writing, and I can't just say he got out of bed, he walked over there, then this, 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 and this. I have to show, try and show it, right? And it's these little innocuous things like sitting in a trailer like these moments in, in a scene maybe he's crossing the street maybe it's uh he looks out the window and sees something where you spend a second and focus on something that really doesn't add necessarily to the plot or move the plot forward or, or anything but it just takes a moment and puts you inside this person's head for a second right because humans were we're messy creatures right we may look like we have it all together but really, we're all over the freaking place. We're looking here, we're looking there, right? Um, so, you know, a story yeah. like this about Roman Coke and tying a drill and whatever, spend a whole chapter on something like this just to really show what kind of person this guy is. Okay. This is a great point. And I had a question. I was actually thinking about this. And I, I don't know where the heck you're going with the connoisseur of alcohol or this story. And let's jump back into that later. But can I have a scroll moment? Because I have a question about writing in this particular. Okay. Um, Adam's breakout. Well. So you told that story, Daniel, and you, you literally said we were in the trailer. We had a rum and Coke and, and you didn't tell me that the trailer was white, but in my head it was white. You didn't tell me that there were silver stairs going up into it, but in my head it was. You didn't tell me that they were standing around a big table and there was drawings on the table, but in my head there was. You didn't need to tell me that for me to know that. What is the added value from an author's perspective to add all these intricate layers of description if our minds will automatically fill them in? Uh, very good question. You're, you're an artist now and not an engineer. Mm. Yeah. So... This is very advanced move, but I think the aha moment is that you asked that question because there's certain liberties that the, you you can assume the li the reader will actually take, and now the magic is to try and figure out how do I accentuate on your image, never have meeting, never have met the the uh, the reader, right? And so, let's say for example. Uh, we took something like the, you know, the metal stairs running up to the Atco trailer. Um, how quickly could I deviate from that? And what every decision you make, you have to think, what value does it bring to the overall narrative? Right. So I could leave that alone. And in my version of the Atco trailer, um, it's just like um, there is no metal stairs. In fact, there wasn't. It was because it was so low to the ground. There, there was no need. There was like a couple, like just a, like a wooden step sort of thing. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I know the ones you're talking about, right? Where, you know, you have a job site trailer and there's, you know, even metal railings and, you know, could be a catwalk. I mean, I've seen these things up at the top of a, of a, of a tower, right? Yeah. And, uh, but anyways, um, I think the idea is to say, because Adam brought up the point to say, well, try and tell the story. And I was going to see, well, there's an element of speed that you want to be aware of, right? Mm -hmm. And unless you're going to do something interesting and unique, like almost throw it down to like a freeze frame sort of thing in the moment of adrenaline, then be aware of your timing as you're doing it. But what Kate's explaining is something more platonic. And it's, it's that if I'm going to take the time to fill in the description for that person, um, it better do something important. And that's got a lot of pressure, but think of that. You know, it's, it's got, it should do something important. Um, 
uh, and and if you think to yourself, well, it's not doing something entirely important, then maybe it's part of a, a consistent type of theme that demonstrates the way the character is actually thinking or the narrator is actually narrating, right? And so we're going to look for some of those consistencies. And so what I find is that when you're writing, even write little side notes about how you approached it so that you can, in a glance, figure out later down the road, I want to do something similar. Um, because that consistency is something that your reader is going to appreciate. And you don't have to describe the actual ATCO trailer. I mean, me saying ATCO means something. Right. And I well, think actually probably more just to Canadians. I don't know if ATCO is a big company, but maybe it's all around the world. I don't know. <laughs> Well, it, it's right. funny, right? And, and I think you, you can illustrate, like, like sticking with the stairs example, right? You know, is it the silver stairs and do they have the holes in them and the railing on the side or, or whatever? But for me, if I were to describe the stairs, I might describe the ringing sound of my boots as I go up the stairs. That to me feels familiar from my times working as a laborer on a construction site or whatever. It's like the ding, ding, ding. Right? It's, the, it's almost like the dinner bell, right? You may drag your foot because of the mud. Yeah, like that. Right, so it's, it's more well. than the stairs. It's it's like well, you know, you've got those big work boots, and you just mm -hmm. drag your feet to, you know, you're looking for a mat. There is no mat, but there's the side piece that has like those side brushes and stuff. And I'm like, fuck that. I'm not doing that. I'm just gonna drag my feet, and then stomp it a little bit, and then. Caitlin's here, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, mean, it's like yeah, I can it's see like, how I am Adam, right? Adam, Adam kind of goes in like this and Caitlin. <laughs> Nailed so, it. Nailed so it. What yeah. you want to do is you want to say the character is going to have something like that. That's like them. And, and to be quite honest, you guys are, you know, novice writers. So you, what you could do is say, fuck it. I'm going to make this Caitlin. Cause it's so easy to tell the truth about what I am. It's just like, I can take that thisness and make that as a part of you know the way the character is right mm -hmm. and uh but put vulnerability in it right like i, I mean uh, so many things run through your mind caitlin right like there's there's um especially my mind so many well, things <laughs> but what I, no but what i'm saying is is that for for all of us whether it's adam he comes in he's kind of assessing the situation you know he's see because adam's got this like this like um ninja sort of ness to him right so he kind of comes in like this and right and then but he's looking at it he's kind of assessing right he's just like i'm gonna look at figure this guy out right so so caitlin's kind of like the distraction and adam's the one kind of <laughs> right yeah. so like natural kingdom stuff like this symbiosis relationship between these two characters and you know uh, you, you know, Adam plays the Columbo guy that's kind of like asking simple questions, but he's like, uh huh, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> I love <laughs> right? So you still hope. Yeah, but you know, uh, Columbo is great because how long does he spend on innocuous detail? Like, why was there dirt on the stairs, right? When he's investigating a murder scene, right? That's Columbo's thing. And I think you can reverse engineer that like you know if if that's important to the story that you come up and you always wipe your feet on them, and then you can spend some time talking about the mud on the shoes and the cleat and then the stairs kind of appear as almost as a result of that right you don't necessarily have to say they're stairs you say oh they're wiping my foot on the edge of the reading but i like what you're saying about timing dan and like the speed of which you want to move things far because i actually struggled to read lord of the rings I don't even think I got through it, to be honest with you, because the guy, I, I know, I mean, I watched the movies like probably close to 60 times. I, I love the storyline, but it drove me nuts that he spent like a page and a half describing a leaf. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I couldn't, I couldn't because my mind moves at such a speed. And I, I just thought everybody saw movies when they read books, but I realized that's not, that's not an everybody thing. Mm. So when I read, I don't see a book. I don't see word. I just see images and it's a movie. It's like watching a movie when I read. So if it's moving too slow for my mind, I struggle yeah. to read it, to digest it. Because I'm like, you've been on this leaf for a page and a half. I already pictured it the very first moment. And you keep reiterating or changing the image in my head because I've already pictured it. 
And I think that's what bothered me. It was like, I already pictured that the leaf was green and it was this shape. Oh, now you're telling me it's this shape. Okay, I have to go back and edit that in my mind. Okay, now, oh, it's not this color green, it's this color green. Now I have to go back and edit it in my mind. And I'm like, get off of this. I want to hear what's happening with the people. I want to, well, maybe that's just me. Or is that? No, no, it's important to point on, just to pause on that for a little bit and realize that this is, this is why in movies, um, cinematography is so amazing right and then and, and you can appreciate that in an, in a snap uh i guess few instances you can get the overall feeling of the cinematography uh the focal length of the camera the um you know the smokiness i guess like the i don't know like the the, the realness or the you know the kind of the feel of of the way it's filmed right there's a difference between a tarantino film and a so I would say embrace this film, this sort of artistic sort of thing and, and, and realize, well, what kind of film do you want to, uh, and you can write in that, in that way, actually. Um, and, and I, I think it is, uh, progressive. I think that trying to spend too much time on a leaf is, um, only relevant if the leaf is really important to the, you know, I mean, but you need you still need to build the scene. Um, there's a term that my, Martin Heidegger uses. Uh, it's called thrownness. And so his concept of consciousness is that we're not really present at the at an individual moment. we're We're thrown into something based off of uh, our projections towards the future and you know what's happened in the past, right? So even if it's not, descriptive in terms of the actual surroundings you can still be emotionally descriptive of how you're approaching things or feeling or navigating a situation so imagine that same um you know kate walks into that atco trailer and maybe for 97 percent of the kateness that just appeared there's no um nothing scared or there's nothing unsure of herself uh, but chances are there is, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's what you pick up on, right? Maybe that's how you're, I mean, I can see the person's body language warming to my delivery and the act that of performance that I'm doing, but somehow there's this like underlining imposter syndrome. Uh, this is, I think women have this a lot too. They're like, I fucking I don't know shit about this, but I'm somehow they're like nodding their heads. So I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> right. You can put that kind of vulnerability into the, because who can't relate with that? Who cannot relate with the fact that anytime you do public speaking, you know, you're a little bit nervous, right? It's just, it just is. I mean, it, you know, I mean, there's a few people, maybe not so much, but, most people, we all get a little bit amped up when it comes to, uh, you know, situations like that, right? So, I think that y it's a, you got to focus on something because you have to give something for people to grab onto, and if you want to make it um, easily adaptable for a film then the fact that you're running that counterpoint in your mind is actually ideal. Again, we fast forward five years from now and it's like, you know, the motion picture that is your guys' novel gets picked up and they're like, thank God Caitlin was on here and wrote this more like a movie than it will be, you know, <laughs> it's easy to adapt, right? <laughs> so my background, like I did a lot of theater and okay. a lot of like that kind of stuff. So I think I write more script like than I do more book like Adam your your eloquent way of writing is definitely gonna have to take over my script like way of writing I think because I think you know there is a huge difference there well I, I think this is where it'll get really interesting right uh, <laughs> where we can kind of combine our superpowers and see what comes out of the mix you know and you really made me think Dan you know the, the level of detail you spend on a, on a scene reflecting the emotion of the character, right? If you're walking up to this trailer and you're going into a job interview, for example, you're super present, you're very nervous, you're conscious of how your clothes fit, right? You're going to step on the steps and you're going to make sure you get all the snow or the mud off and you're going to 
pull the door open and right so you spend some time because that's the character's frame of mind but if i'm just you know these are my buddies in there and i got the booze and i'm ready to party then bam open the door and get to the party right because that's that's where the person's mind is right yeah yeah you kind of convey i think um the emotion of what you're experiencing or trying by focusing on little things or not i don't know hey you guys are doing fine you're doing absolutely you guys are doing really well and the only and the other ad piece of advice i'd give you caitlin is to say even if it feels unnatural just spend some more time describing what's in your mind and eventually Mm -hmm. the editor can pare all of that down you can say well this isn't moving fast paced enough for me have a little note that says that but at least you describe the scene and even if the description is like awkward, it's not written well, or it doesn't feel like it's flowing properly, the fact is, is you've 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 pounded through uh, like chapter seven or something like that. Like you've you've you know developed it to a point where we can say, well, you know, the the, the pace here is a little bit fast. Why don't we do cut this? Yeah. Cut. Oh, it's so easy to cut, to cut, 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 cut. <laughs> And so if the goal is on a novel is to be about 80 to 120,000 words, you know, you guys should shoot for about 200,000 words and then work to parse it down. Uh, it, unless it's, I mean, that would be a good, I think a good, a good idea. Right. And, you know, probably around, I mean, how many chapters do you guys have right now? What are you, are you thinking? I don't even think I have a full chapter. Well, yeah, I've just you know not produced, but how many chapters? Like, was it a twenty chapter book, or I can't remember? So, I, we have the link. Um, to the- I, that sounds right, twenty ish. Um, I think. Right? Sure, I'll go with that. <laughs> I don't know. The story's gonna go where it's gonna go. Like, yeah, we have like, lots of the subplots. It might be one of those ones where we write fifty chapters and go, okay, this is where the first book ends. <laughs> Yeah. Well, think think about it this way. You know, I mean, uh, you know, a- Adam's written a couple blog posts, for example, and they're probably about 500 to 1,000 words. So for each chapter, you want to try and think, well, is it possible to hit the 10K mark in terms of words? And think about how am I going to structure this? Now, there's exceptions to the rule. You can have something that ends up being uh, an 800-word chapter. Right. But, you know, if you're thinking that, you know, roughly that means then other chapters have to have more words. But like what 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 would be involved in a 10,000 word chapter? Mm-hmm. That's a lot of writing. Right. And you have to try and think how, you know, there's a lot of ability to develop um, characters in there and, you know, develop the story. And, you know, you, you, you got a lot of time to develop things. Right. And I guess to use the film analogy. Um, think of all the backstory that has to happen for for us, all of us, to enjoy a Lord of the Rings episode, right? Uh, it, it's like you know the the from that like dark horse sort of standpoint, and the way it breathes, and 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 the way it moves, and that like is, you know supposed to represent death, you know, like the that that's something that we can see with our mind uh, in the theater, right? Or sorry, we can see in the theater, but y- you know, you, you have to describe it. it. It takes more building to do that. Yeah. And I've noticed uh, in a lot of books, the chapter length will start to shrink as you get to the climax because the pace is speeding up. Right. Yeah. You're going to get into the, like the ending. So all of a sudden the chapters go from, you know, whatever, like you said, 10,000 words, like they'll start to shorten up as the scenes get and then they'll maybe elongate again as you get. Um, the, these rules are something when I was writing, I'm, I'm still in the process of writing my book, Will Freeman. Right. But there's mm-hmm. chapter 16 is actually a screenplay. It's actually written as a screenplay. Oh, cool. um, you know, that's one entire chapter. Um, the other aspects of it is that you have forward chronology and then you have like reverse chronology in, um, in, in, in journal entries. 
star date four three two five point one. Right. <laughs> but oh, you just made Adam really happy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like there's this this uh, you know, there's this reverse chronology. So the characters actually come together from the reverse chronology and the forward chronology coming to a particular point in time. Right. Now, that's not prescriptive. You don't have to take that as. But you know, it's it's one of the ways that I you know I'm I'm trying to you know bring the characters together in a in a convergence of of uh, of, of time, right? And, and and those you can kind of get in your head and think, okay, this is how we're doing it, right? Structurally, yeah. And and then just you know basically fill in the gaps. So you guys are doing a wonderful job. I think you guys are doing pretty good. All I know is they're having fun. It's it's um it's like a I don't know a breath of fresh air, you know. We're, we're trying to do all the other things in life, and you're taking a moment to write something just for because we like we want to is uh, really nice. Yeah, it's going to be a huge accomplishment to say that you have those twenty chapters, and then whether you publish it or not, or where you take it, how you take it to another editor, what you guys do with it. Maybe you want to sit on it for a year. I don't know. Maybe you want to have it as a um, a downloadable one where people can still, um, you know, comment and stuff on it, mm -hmm. right? And it's still kind of a work in progress. Um, you know, it's it, you know, I mean, it 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 really is up to you. But um, my suggestion would be that uh, you get it to the point where it's a you know, it's a, it's a working story and then, you know, bring on a really, really good editor that has um, experience in science fiction and say, okay, now, you know, now how do we, how do we progress? And, uh, and, and, you know, then the journey continues, right? Yeah. I love it. It's just, a, there's a writing process that we're just following. Right. Who knew? There you go. <laughs> Right. So we're approaching the top of the hour. Kate, do you want to finish it off with a, a snippet of reading? And then you'll be able to bookend this this particular podcast. You started with the intro and you can finish with the... Um, I can do that. I gotta, are you going to give us sultry or is it normal, Kate? Uh, I, what do you want, Dan? I love sultry. I just, yeah. I can do it sultry. Okay, so you've the last time we talked and I read... Where did I end up? Um, I think you should introduce the two uh, the scene. The two, two characters? Parts. That's a really short one, so it'll be good. Okay. And Dan, just mm -hmm. for your perspective, uh, I did not describe any of the scene in this. It's pretty okay. much just interaction. So it's very script-like. Adam can come in and, and add his amazing thing. Okay, you ready? Yep. Here goes. Almost got it. Come on, she, you have to get it this time or we're screwed. Whispers Quash as he shifts his weight from one foot to the other, impatiently watching over Sheik's shoulder. Entering code as fast as he's ever seen anyone move. She wasn't kidding when she said she was the fastest coder in the Andean galaxy. Cash had, had, had been selected for this mission three times, but had never been able to execute his part. Each coder had failed subsequently and subsequently been released which sounded a lot more pleasant than it was. He really was rooting for Sheik. He liked her quirky personality. Yeah, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Sheik didn't stop for a second, glancing around at the five screens running information that Cash didn't understand. Who is Sherlock? Ah, I hacked an Earth system once where there were these audio stories about an amazing human named Sherlock. He was a detective and solved mysteries, uh, pissed off the local law enforcement. Great guy. Sheik was infatuated with Earth and their idiosyncrasies. No wonder she took this job. There, boom, just like that. She sat back in her chair and cracked her knuckles as she stretched her hands above her head. You did it, Cash exclaimed, excited that he would be able to possibly fulfill his contract this time. His family was starting to get desperate for money. Ah, don't look so surprised, Cash. I told you I could. Now we wait. That's all Love I got so far. I love it. Cool. You know, um, I have to. I have to put a plug in for uh, for Doyle because the thing is, is that um, in a fiction, 
sometimes a fiction can be more real than real life. And so this address of 221 B Baker, Baker Street, Street. Baker is, Street. Uh, yeah. is, 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 is the fictional home of, 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 of this detective. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, for, for many people, uh, he, he is more real than anybody that could live at that, at that address. I love Sherlock Holmes. One of my faves. Yeah. Um, one small little thing to leave everybody with is that on the dialogues, what I find to be really masterful uh, is when you hold people in tension as the as you're as you're developing the dialogue, right? It's kind of like this idea of um, you know the horror movie, and you're like telling the you know the girl in the tight sweater that's running out, you know, in a skirt, you know, out into like the or into the basement, like, just go upstairs or stay in the house. Like, you know, like you're building this, like, you know, you're building this tension. And so characters can have that same sort of thing too. Right. You, um, and Tarantino does this really well, where it's, it's like, you're just holding right on something and just like holding them right at the end of a, of a, of a joke or a, a tension, like you're building tension in the dialogue. So, okay. um, yeah, ch- keep trying to do that. Um, say what this dialogue is saying, but what is it saying underneath? Kind of like a Disney movie, right? Religion, religion's masterful at this, right? Is, yeah, okay. There's the, the narrative that everybody understands, and then there's the bigger narrative that may contain the wisdom, right? So, you know, try and play with this this idea when you're doing your dialogues. Thank yeah, you. that's great. Thank you. Oh my gosh, this, this, this episode was full of gems, man. We're going to pull them out. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, anything else? No, I just say, Caitlin, I don't think that scene necessarily needs any more describing than that. The painted a picture in my mind of what was going on. So I think it's fine, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Awesome. Okay, so uh, you know, I'll I'll work on your your little highlight reel there. Um, okay. okay. And then until next time, everybody, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Thanks, Adam. Bye. Bye.